welcome back everybody to another webinar from Princeton for everybody worldwide. We're very happy to have Luis Caricano with us today. Hi, yes. Luis. Hello, Marcus. Great to be here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Luis uh, is an old friend of mine and, uh, you know, uh, taught at the University of Chicago, LSC, now visiting Colombia and uh, from Spain. And he was in the European Parliament for several years now. And he will talk about the debt and the euro. So we will learn a lot about uh, the European situation at the moment. One thing we have learned about the high inflation environment, of course, is that inflation is also driven by fiscal considerations. It's not only a monetary issue. And if I start with a few opening remarks, uh, one thing is, you know, what's the monetary fiscal interaction? If you listen to Milton Friedman, he said famously, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. So the medium of exchange role, the quantity equation is at the core of the monetarist's view. While Tom Sargent actually said, inflation is always and everywhere a fiscal phenomenon. Now, of course, the two uh, elements to that one is the Sargent Wallace view from this famous uh, paper, The Arithmetics, uh, where there's essentially real debt and there's a money demand, there's a medium of exchange, and the price level is determined by the quantity equation still. And if the debt level is getting too high and the primary surplus in the future too small, you need some additional synergy income. And anticipating that, that leads to inflation. The other very prominent theory is the fiscal theory of the price level, where the emphasis is not the immediate exchange role of money, but the safe store of value. And the nominal debt is, is key, so the B plus the money supply on top of it. So it's not, not naturally a money demand, but essentially it's like an asset pricing equation. So we have covered this FTBL equation many, many times. So there's, uh, there's money and there's the bond value, the nominal value divided by the price level gives you the real value of the government debt outstanding, including the money. That is the expected present value of all the primary surpluses, the tax revenue minus the expenditures. That's the traditional FTBL equation. And of course, if R is smaller than G or can be smaller than G, they also have potentially a bubble term. Now, this equation, you can actually reformulate by discounting at the repressive agent uh, discount rate, then you get the same, the, the real value of all government debt outstanding is just the expected present value of the tax revenue minus the expenditures plus the expected present value of all the service flows. And that's you know corresponding to the bubble is actually a service flow. So the safe asset gives you a service flow whenever there is a shock. It's a safe asset. You can sell the safe asset at a high value. And this overcomes some financial frictions, for example, some incumbent markets frictions. On top of it, whenever there's a crisis or a recession, the idiosyncratic risk people face and probably cannot insure themselves with social with, uh, contracts, the service flow becomes more important and it becomes more available. So in times of crisis, actually the service flow gains in value. That gives the whole the real value of the government bonds a negative beta. So if you have an, a government bond, which is a safe asset, that actually typically has a negative beta. So in times of crisis, it appreciates in real value. And that's actually a very, very nice feature to have for somebody who can issue uh, these uh, safe assets. And that's an extraordinary privilege a government enjoys if it has the safe asset status. But for this to have the safe asset, you have to be able to defend it. And to defend the safe asset status, uh, you have to have enough fiscal capacity. So in a sense, this bubble term or the service flow term that corresponds to this bubble term can burst so it can go away because it's, it's a fragile uh, thing, the safe asset status, or the bubble can also jump from the government debt to another asset. It could be some foreign debt or it could be some crypto asset. So the bubble can actually jump to some other assets. But of course, the government can defend uh, this privilege on its own. But for this, it needs fiscal capacity. And it needs it at least out of equilibrium. So the beliefs have to be, it has to be credible enough. If this bubble were to burst, the government will step in and raise taxes or cut expenditures in order to protect the high value, the high real value of the government bonds. So that's really important to have this fiscal capacity at least of equilibrium. So you have to have uh, this credibility uh, if you want to maintain the safe asset privilege or the exorbitant privilege and in your government. And there are only few government debts who really have this great uh, privilege. And uh, you know that's extremely valuable to maintain. Now, once you go to um, uh, the fiscal capacity, the monetary unit is, of course, more complicated. 
because you don't have one fiscal authority playing with the monetary authority. Soon there will be 20 after Croatia is joining the European um, Monetary Union. There will be 20 fiscal bonds and there's also the euro bonds which the government is issuing or the European Union is issuing with the next generation bonds. So you have 21 fiscal authorities essentially and you have one monetary authority playing a very complicated game of chicken with each other. And there's of course in the setup there's a contradiction on the one hand, we have the Nobela clause in the Maastricht Treaty and an international treaty and the prohibition of government financing through the ECB. On the other hand, we want to pretend that all government bonds enjoy the safe asset status and all of them enjoy the exorbitant privilege. So even if they don't have the fiscal capacity to defend it, and that's, that's a tension there and it shows up all the time. And of course it can be translated into a different language like TPI when monetary transmission mechanism might be impaired, but that's a basic tension. Uh, on the one hand, you would like to have the exorbitant privilege for all government bonds, all 20 government bonds, but not all of them have the fiscal capacity to defend it, and that's a challenge. So with that, let me move on to the poll question. Thanks again for answering all the poll questions. We always appreciate your feedback, and I think these are questions Luis put forward, and he probably will go back and will you know, change your opinion later on. And some of them are factual questions. So, so in the Maastricht Treaty, of course, we had the 3% rule. The deficit should not go beyond 3%. And at that level to GDP should not go beyond 60%. How many countries do you think will, are satisfying or above or not satisfying this requirement? Less than five out of the 27? The European Union is, of course, larger than the European Monetary Union. Uh, less than half or but more than five or more than half. And the answers you gave us were 11%, 9%, and uh, 79%. And I think Luis will tell us what is the right answer. The second question is the next generation sovereign e bond issue. So the European Union issued says next generation sovereign bond, some euro bond. Is it an exceptional one off issuance? As it was stated, the COVID is extraordinary. It is just once we do it only once and never again. Or is it just the beginning of more bond issuances? So we just ignore all uh, uh, agreements with it before. And the people thought, the audience thought 28%, you stick to the law and the agreement. 72% think that just is a piece of paper. Nobody cares about a piece of paper. Um, a third question is, can the EU raise taxes on its own? So if you have the fiscality of the price level, uh, you have to have some primary surpluses and raise some taxes. Uh, can it raise taxes or not? Um, and 36% said no, 64%, uh, 36% said yes, but 64% uh, uh, said no. Okay, the true answer is, of course, they have no tax authority uh, to raise any taxes. The first question is, how much bigger was the ECB's balance sheet at the end of the 2021 compared to US Federal Reserve's balance sheet as a percentage of GDP comparing apples to apples? Was it roughly the same? So ECB and, and Fed had roughly the same size of the balance sheet. Was the ECB 25% larger, 25% larger, 50% larger, 75% larger, or twice as large? And the answers you gave us is roughly the same, 55%. The big majority said it's roughly the same what the ECB and the Fed is doing. A 25% larger, so QE was way more pronounced, and PEP and all these programs was more pronounced in Europe, 21%. 50% larger, 70%, 75% larger, 6%, and twice as large, only 2%. So and I will not give it away. I leave it to Luis to reveal the truth, but I think it's, uh, you will see it was way larger in Europe. Finally, what is the interest rate spread between the 10-year EU debt, so the euro bond, compared to the German bond? Is it negligible, or is it just between 65, 75 basis points? Uh, and the answer for that uh, was what you gave us. It's tiny, it's 38% uh, thought this way, and 62% thought it's about 65, 70 basis points. With this, I pass on the floor, the digital mic to Luis, and we're looking forward to his uh, talk on the debt and the euro uh, today. Thanks again, Luis. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mark. This is really a privilege and a pleasure to be here with, with this audience and to have your introduction uh, reminding people of something that um, we as economists shouldn't be reminded but I think we forgot which is that inflation and debt are closely linked um, <clears throat> and I want to use two facts to motivate this this talk or to start this talk one from today is always it's always nice to have 
to have something happen in the same it's the same day that, that you're talking. Um, Christine Lagarde just announced that uh, the, the QT decision is going to start uh, reducing the balance sheet, or the, the board the board has decided to start reducing the the size of the of the balance sheet of the European Central Bank at the rate of 15 billion a month starting in March. It will only take 333 months to eliminate the balance sheet. That's 27 years. I hope Marcus and me are around to see the end of this of this QT exercise. Obviously, that's assuming there's no crisis, no needs for new QEs, etc. The balance sheet of the ECB, um, it is true that it's similar size in euros or dollars at, at some point it has been. The eurozone GDP is much lower. Um, and it's not the Europe uh, GDP, but the eurozone GDP, 67% of the eurozone GDP, which is almost twice as much, 75% more, uh, to your surprise, to the large surprise of many of you, uh, than the <laughs> one, the QE in the United States. That's my first fact. Um, QT starts, starts slowly. Um, it was conceived as a QE, was conceived as a monetary operation, but today with the end of QE and the start of QT, nothing about this having an impact on inflation has been argued by the ECB. Uh, the second fact I want, I want to raise, which I also asked you about uh, in the poll, has to do with the spread of the EU debt, of the, the German 10-year uh, debt. And this is a, a recent piece I, I, I put up with, with uh, Giovanni Bonfanti uh, from Colombia. And if you look at the ECB, at all the European issuers, which have been issuing for a long time, are uh, all these gray lines. They have been close to the Netherlands, so really, and risk-free territory. And they've been getting, after QE was announced, the end of QE was announced, they've been getting pretty close actually, the two uh, Spanish debt and, and far from risk-free territory. If you look or include the EU bonds, which are a recent, more recent one, that's why I used, I used the longer uh, issuers to compare, you see that the EU bonds are also in that kind of 60, 70, 75 basis points territory, which is kind of not something very happy. Uh, you, you would want to have the, some of these debt is joint and several guarantee. We'll discuss that in a second. Uh, you would want it to be a safe asset and to enjoy all that exorbitant privilege or bubble status that Marcus was telling us about. So let me start from the start of these two motivating facts with the Maastricht Treaty. Many of you know it, but just let me remind you that the, the Maastricht Treaty was designed with a very, very limited fiscal capacity in, in mind. Countries were supposed to borrow moderately to repay their debts and to not ask anybody else for fiscal transfers. So they agreed to debt and deficit limits. They agreed, in fact, to a, a triple lock. A triple lock uh, that involves forbidding monetary financing in the Article 123, limiting deficits and debts, and no bailout. The monetary financing provision you all know, it basically is forbidden for, uh, for the ECB or the national central banks to purchase directly debt. I don't think the treaty writers thought that the main tool of monetary policy would ever be anything other than interest rates. But in any case, the prohibition has been considered satisfied as long as it's not purchased directly. You see the word directly here. Uh, which has been the one that has allowed for, for QE. Um, second, there are deficits and debt limits. Uh, deficit limit at 3% of the GDP and debt limit at 60% enforced with fines and the Stability and Growth Pact. In fact, no fines have ever been levied. That was a, a question that I was going to, to ask you as well. The union also has um, a, for, a, a prohibition of, 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 of engaging into issuing debt with a balanced budget rule that says the revenue expenditures shown in the budget shall be in balance. And that's why most operations until very recently have been off balance sheet operations with special purpose vehicles uh, set up in Luxembourg, like the European stability mechanism was set up in that way. Um, the um, uh, third lock, this triple lock, is the Nobel out uh, clause that doesn't allow a member state to uh, bail out somebody else in another member state. And the reason for this is to avoid the pressure that could result in people expecting uh, to receive this help. Uh, so there is a no bail, uh, bailout clause. What is interesting is that the treaty is very sharp on what should happen. Everybody should behave very nicely. But it's not at all clear on what happens if people don't behave very nicely, in particular if they come by bad behavior or by, by luck into a debt crisis. There is no IMF-like institution to provide help uh, in the treaty. So you will not get some support if, if that happens. But there's also, okay, I'm not getting support. I'm not supposed to be in debt. What do I do? Well, you cannot debt do, or the treaty doesn't talk about debt restructuring either. So there is no clear 
kind of way out of a situation of debt overhang or excessive debt in these treaties. The other thing that is not, and, and Marcus and me and many others have, have worked a lot on this uh, during the euro crisis was banking union. There was no joint uh, banking regulation, no joint supervision, no deposit insurance. And, 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 and partly because, okay, host regulators like to control banks, like to have the political power uh, to ring fence like liquidity to direct investment by the banks. And, and as a result, there was, banks have been very national in, in many cases, and, and even more after the euro crisis, and there has been little uh, between country risk sharing. And also there are no euro-wide tools in the treaty for uh, banking crisis. The emergency liquidity assistance is a question of the national central banks. You would wonder, do we have national central banks? Yes, we have, and they play a big, big role, as you will see in what follows. So this construction has like kind of very good intentions, but not a very clear support for those good intentions. It's kind of something that we do in Europe sometimes by design. You build a halfway house and you expect that when the rain comes, somebody will come and build the roof. That's not necessarily the best way to, to, to get to a good place, but at least you advance, that's the idea. But it was tested during the Euro crisis. And I'm not going to tell you about the Euro crisis. You know, Marcus wrote a good book and others, Shoko Mori also wrote a good book about it. And, and, and many of you know a lot about it. I just want to remind you that there was this, this particularly these, these four countries, uh, Greece, Ireland, Portugal, and, and Spain, which got into very large net debt positions, not just the government debt, but the country debt, that some of the current account deficits over all these years. Uh, and, and they basically couldn't finance themselves at some point. And, um, I just want to show you one example of what that was. Here is the Irish case, two banks, Anglo-Irish and Nationwide. This is from a very nice paper by Carl Willem that I recommend you to, to read if you care about the Irish crisis, which is beautiful. Deposits and debt securities were the main liability in those, in those balance sheets of these banks. Basically, people take all the money away. And you see there is a deposit run here, and it gets replaced by Eurosystem borrowings, which are borrowings with collateral, and ELA, emergency liquidity assistance, which is without collateral. This is really problematic because it leaves the ECB on the hook. So after this, obviously a rescue and a very complicated situation. It wasn't well managed. Uh, it was, there were many, many problems with this, but let me just leave it at this. So in some countries like Ireland and Spain, what happened was the banks, a private debt contaminated public debt. The banks uh, passed on this, this, this crisis to the sovereigns, transmitted uh, this crisis to the sovereigns. The solvency, the lack of solvency of banks meant the sovereigns who were, there was no, the, remember, no deposit insurance at European level, no rescue tools at European level. The sovereigns themselves were responsible for their own banks. And in other countries like Greece and Portugal, it was the sovereigns which, which passed on this crisis to the banks. Um, the crisis left to, to repeated moments of, of panic with interest rates really skyrocketing. Here you see Greece in brown, also Italy is in brown, but, but other countries before, like here is Portugal in yellow. Uh, all of these are uh, Ireland, all of these other countries in crisis. Spain is in blue with, with, with uh, Italy also in, in, in brown. And, 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 and these are kind of the countries that were the canary in the gold mine, uh, and, and that it was felt that the euro was under threat. At that point, the ECB's desire to survive and to protect the euro kind of asserted itself. And there were rescues that didn't really do the job, uh, even though over the medium term, I think they have been successful. But the crisis was considered to have finished when Draghi, basically, Mario Draghi as president of the ECB, um, said, look, we are going to, the euro is going to survive. Forget about any possibility of anybody exiting the euro. We're going to do our job and that's going to be enough. More or less, that is his message. This is well, well known. What is less well known is that the kind of program that Draghi put in place uh, to back up his promise, which is called the outright monetary transactions, had two elements which are going to be crucial for the story that I'm going to want to tell you, which is the story of, of, of the current situation. We had fiscal backing from the Union of States. Uh, there was something called the European Stability Mechanism, which was a program that would back up the, 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 the debt of these countries in case the ECB wanted to withdraw. There was a fiscal backing behind, and there was conditionality there were, that would ensure that the measures were Temporary. There was a troika that would supervise that the banks, that the states would do what is necessary in order to get out of this situation. And I just want to show you what Draghi thought about this because I think it's very illuminating. He said, 
uh, explaining all these measures. It's important in providing the ECB, the conditionality is important in providing the ECB with the adequate assurance that interventions supporting sovereign debt bond prices do not mutate into financial subsidies for a sustainable national policy. So he thought conditionality in the intervention of the ECB was essential to avoid these subsidies, these becoming subsidies for national politics, for this to be real uh, monetary policy. Um, you can agree with this with his decision or not. I think most people think he did very well. The ESM was set up as a, as a fiscal twin of this with uh, 700 billion in subscribed in, in, in capital, but 500 billion in, in maximum lending capacity in order to ensure that it had uh, sufficient uh, over collateralization and try to get a triple A rating. Um, with this fiscal uh, mechanism, this conditionality, basically, our view is that Mario Draghi avoided the breakout of the euro without creating high in inflation and without risking the unsustainable public finances. This is because of these two elements that I was mentioning conditionality and the fiscal backstop. Now we get to 2015. And there is a risk of deflation. And you know that other central banks were doing quantitative easing. We're in the zero lower bound. And, and Marcus has had multiple seminars about this. The question was, what could the ECB do? And the reason this is an issue is because, as you recall, Article 123 says you cannot do monetary financing. How are you going to buy government bonds? And the ECB answer is, look, to the extent that we have two limits on the way we, we, we operate with debt, this is not monetary policy. And the two limits are, we're not going to buy more than 23% of any issue so that it gets traded in the market. And we are going to buy uh, the sovereign bonds in proportion to the capital key. So it's going to be automatic. We'll buy all member states in similar proportions to how big they are, if you allow me to say it in this way. That way we're not favoring one state, we're not financing one state. Those were the two conditions that ensure that this would be QE. And this was basically at the start to fight deflation, eventually become something to try to get inflation between from 1.5 to 2%. So it's like, okay, we have forecast of, of, of 1.5. Um, we want to try to move it up to two. We're going to do 5 trillion, well, eventually 5 trillion worth QE. But I'm going too fast because this is pre-pandemic. Um, this is what, uh, in the left, you have what was bought of banks on the right of sovereigns. And you see that, the TLTROs, the, the, the financing provided to banks was around 600 billion eventually before the pandemic. And the purchases of assets of the states, including cover bonds, asset-backed securities and public sector um, bonds is around 3 trillion. Now, that's QE. It's a different animal in a monetary union. You have, as Marco said, 19, almost 20 right now, monetary authorities uh, in, in a very short time. And it was always kind of problematic. It was clear that we had to get out, et cetera. What happens? What happens is that we get another one in a century crisis, our second one in a century crisis in 10 years, the pandemic. There's a monetary response that goes through something called the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, which basically is a program that allows the bank to buy 750 billion. And one crucial thing changes flexibility of purchases across over time, over asset classes, over jurisdictions. The bank can now, the ECB can now purchase also Greek debt, and it can also um, buy in proportions that go away from the capital key. Because it's a pandemic, because it's a crisis, everybody kind of understands. And here you see how the balance sheet dramatically expands. On the left, you have uh, banks, uh, the TLTROs, the targeted uh, long-term refinancing operations where the bank puts a, the ECB puts a target to the banks of how many loans they have and gives them subsidized money in exchange. And on the right, you have sovereign purchases. The orange is the PEPP, the per Pandemic Emergency Pro Purchase Program. And you see that this is 5 trillion and the other one is almost 2.5 trillion. Um, these, are, these are very large, these are very large programs that, as you will see, are going to be, uh, are going to be uh, hard to unwind, and that's a big part of our discussion. That was the monetary response to the pandemic. There was also a fiscal response, which was also unprecedented. From the parliament, I was at the time a parliamentarian, I was one of the people writing these resolutions. In fact, this one I, I mostly wrote. Um, this was from my group and then from the parliament, in which we said, look, we need to have a program of joint European debt to finance the reconstruction. And it's not just, I mean, in a way, you don't want to do this monetarily. This is a fiscal problem. It's a fiscal solution. 
and we need to issue some bonds. It took a couple of months for this to be happening, but eventually we issued European debt. The first instrument was to finance Shore. And Shore was done in still in a kind of old fashioned way, is back to bank lending. This is an important concept in European lending, which is I give you a loan, I, I borrow in the market to give you a loan. So the only difference is to give the state a, a loan. So in this case, this vehicle um, uh, does back-to-back -back lending. Part of it is under the EU budget, this 9 uh, billion fit under the limit fixed by the member states of how much the European Union can spend. So this is the spending euro, uh, limit of the European uh, Union, which is fixed by unanimity by the member states every seven years. And the rest is done with voluntary joint pro rata guarantees of the member states in the way that it has been done in the past. Nothing very, very exceptional, although it is European Union debt. What is really exceptional is this second program, the next generation program, which as you see dwarfs already by now, this is, this is data of today, basically, but it's going to get all the way to 1 trillion um, because it was 2018, um, uh, 750 billion at 2018 uh, euros. This is a different, completely different animal. The uh, next generation is the first time that the European Union decides to issue debt together. Um, with the backing of the EU budget and not with the member states' individual guarantees, and that it decides that this is going to finance spending. Okay, I can talk if Marco pushes me later a little bit about the legal engineering that allows something that says the budget, the, tax, the revenue, and the, and the expenditure has to be in balance to actually issue debt. But the fact is, debt was issued uh, to finance expending by member states. Three hundred ninety billion is actually to finance direct spending. So it's a big step, in many ways a positive step by Europe, um, but as I will show you, it's a bit insatisfactory or more than a bit. Look, Europe, the European Union is not financed, as many of you would have imagined, and in fact, in the, in, the, in, the, in the poll, many of you said, through taxes that it levies. It is not allowed to levy taxes. This is a, one of the incomplete aspects of the construction. The Parliament, where I was sitting, and the and the member states uh, together decide on the spending, and the parliament has a lot of say, but it doesn't have any say on the revenue. The member states haggle over it, like the United Nations budget kind of thing. You have to pass the hat and get people to make commitments. Um, member state contributions directly, tariff and custom duties flow directly to the European Union, but they get netted out with the member state contribution and value added tax base contribution. So a lot of it is basically passing the hat around in order to issue so debt. Do you think there will be the border adjustment tax for CO2 uh, aspects, a digital tax? Do you think it has to come because Europe needs the revenue to back its own debt? Europe needs it's just we will be forced to do these taxes, not for environmental reasons, but just to back. It is crucial, debt. right? We talked about uh, in, in, that, in, in, in the legislation that authorized this borrowing, the parliament demanded that a set of five or six or seven uh, different types of taxes would flow to pay something like 15, 18 billion dollars in interest a year. And, and those would be the digital tax, which now is not really going to exist because we have the 15% minimum corporate tax rate agreement with the OCDE. That will be the plastics tax that did go into the EU budget, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, part of the ATS. The problem is, and we saw it with ATS, every time there's a new source of revenue, the member states who are always also very troubled try to get this, this revenue for themselves. So Every time there was kind of big words about this money going to the European Union, and in practice, it's really hard to get it. I really hope, Marcus, my, my answer is I really hope so, but there's not a legal commitment. And that's the problem. The problem is that you need, we have issued you need joint uh, borrowing. An international treaty for that, or you can just by agreement by the government? You government. could do it by agreement. You would have to pass a new kind of, quote, international treaty, which would be a known resource decision. And ORD, the own resource decision gets ratified by the 27 member states, and it was the own resource decision which allowed. So basically, the way Europe was allowed to borrow is to increase that budget ceiling to fit inside the ceiling the yearly borrow of the European Union every year. But that doesn't tell you how it gets repaid because the budget only lasts seven years. So in the next budget, when it comes seven years, then people will have to say, "Oh yeah, we have this obligation." But as European Union, let's see how we haggle. Are we going to pay more into the budget 
Are we going to give that some new tax into the budget? Or are we going to decrease the common agricultural policy or the structural policies? The point that makes this a little bit, makes us makes me a bit uneasy, is that this is nowhere actually decided. There will be haggling in a few years. And if there is no new resources, somebody will have to either pay more or cut the budget of things that are politically very sensitive. This is negotiated every seven years. And in particular, if one country were to leave, there would be, I, I don't know, a lot of temptation for, by that country to renege on this European Union debt. So it's not the same as a sovereign state. You know, Marcus, it's like, you know, this, I don't know who wrote this, somebody used, as some European, a US president used to say, and when I want to call to Europe, who do I have to dial? And this is a bit the same idea when I want to renegotiate European debt or when I have to do something about the debt, I'm an investor, who do I call? Well, the European Commission, but it doesn't have the right to issue in taxes or so the 27 member states. And this is what makes this not quite the Hamiltonian moment we all were. But so far, the market believes there will be some resolution. Otherwise, it wouldn't buy the debt. No, well, of course, the, the, until the, now, the, the, the people all this debt. So. You're right. The European market, the, the, the market believes that, look, the countries stand behind the European Union. The countries are serious about the European Union. There is a lot of people who believe that. I mean, so so the, the case where it would be problematic would be if one country walks out from this money. But politically, that is so risky. And it has happened with Brexit. It's it's just been seen to be crazy. So I think most of us believe, of course, by far, that this is obviously as good as sovereign debt. The problem is, it's probably as good as sovereign debt, but the legal aspects are, are of course, much more tricky. Um, and that's that's part of what that's what it, part of what makes probably makes it makes it risky. Is I would say, a, because is this very long term debt uh, issued at a very low interest rate? It's, so later away. No, it's been. I mean, I think it should have been issued at very very long uh, mm. term and very fast to get to get rid of it, uh, at, at taking advantage of the of the window. In fact, I, I proposed at the time there was uh, perpetuals securities, but it didn't work. But I would say, uh, but the, 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 the general director of budget has preferred, or the commission has preferred to issue at all maturities to try to build the yield curve, to try, I mean, the thinking is trying to see this as a start. And that's why my question to the to the audience, trying to see it as a start of a uh, euro bond market with, 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 de with debt at all maturities, with the whole yield curve, et cetera. The problem is liquidity is not so big. And at low, at, at short uh, maturities, this is not really, I mean, this is not really very liquid at the moment. That's the truth. I think the European Central Bank has been buying uh, probably a large part from what I told you before about the QE uh, of, of my piece. So how do we exit? This is where we get to the crux of our presentation and our discussion. How do we exit? Look, this the, the basic problem we are facing is that we invented something which was QE, which was clearly monetary. And if you see all the documents from the central bank at the time, it was about monetary policy. There's no question about it. But in some way, it has transmuted in a sort of quasi-fiscal policy. Look at the central bank holdings of government bonds as percent of GDPs post-pandemic. Basically, in many countries, the entirety of the pandemic issuance has been bought by the ECB. You see increases of 20 points of GDP uh, in, in the course of a year or a couple of years of what the central bank is holding of government bonds. Look at two particular countries that are interesting, which are Italy and, and Spain. Um, first, look at, at the increase in the debt of these countries. Spain was very responsible uh, in, in, uh, in the run-up. Of course, it had a bubble. In the run-up of the crisis, it has 30% debt to GDP ratio. Uh, it's, it's gone up to 120. That's the right-hand side uh, scale in the black line. The holdings, who's holding this debt and who has increased the holdings? This green is the Spanish central bank, 40 points of GDP. This blue is the domestic banking sector, not much smaller than what we, Marcus, were talking about. You, you call it the diabolic loop, other people call it the doom loop. Not much smaller in terms of how exposed the domestic banking sector is, is exposed to this. Then there are the domestic uh, non-bank people who are basically getting out the foreign official sector, the foreign banks, and the foreign non-banks. Look at Italy. Between the Italian central bank, 40 points as well, and the domestic banking sector, that's 85-90% of, 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 of debt. So basically what we have is 
basically all of these extra issuance from uh, in the last few years has been only bought by the national, the green, expanding green area, the national central banks. Um, and now we have the third once in a generation crisis in 10 years, which is the energy crisis and the Ukraine war and the, all the disaster that comes, the Russian invasion, et cetera. So what you have is again, a big increase in debt. That is again, uh, here you see, for example, Germany, seven points of GDP just for the energy. Okay, This is just Bruegel's calculation of how much are the energy measures. Um, uh, these, are, these are very, very significant, uh, again, uh, 270 billion, just in the, in the general case. Um, of course, we all know the general government debt is, is very high and over the Maastricht threshold. The key, the answer to the question was 14 out of 27 countries were not fulfilling the, the, the fiscal rules. And we have something that we are all aware, I just want to put it on the table, okay? Which is the non-funded pension liabilities. This is, I just want to show you the basic calculation of the net accrued pension entitlements by Eurostat, the net present value of the difference between what is committed and what is actually being paid. And these are amounts on the order of 300, 400% of GDP by my calculation. I uh, hope it's, it's, all, it's all correct. Uh, Italy, 400% of GDP. So we have countries that have a demographic problem that have a lot of debt and a, a country and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a European Central Bank that, that is holding a lot of it. My fear is that the current situation doesn't provide the right incentives to bring this fiscal position under control. Um, and, and the reason is this. First, look at the ECB. The European Central Bank is worried about starting to reverse monetary policy and having what it calls disturbances in the monetary transmission mechanism. It worries about people, uh, you go up 1% in, in your interest rate, in your basic interest rate, and, and the debt for Italy goes up by three or by four because people start to panic about individual countries. So the European Central Bank says, no, 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 we're not going to allow that. We're going to, first of all, we continue forgetting about buying according to the capital key. So we're going to kind of sell northern debt and buy southern debt, but also if there is real trouble, we're going to introduce a mechanism which is going to be called the transmission protection instrument, which we will use um, to, to, uh, to um, counter this word unwarranted, does a huge amount of work, okay? And for all, all of those of you economists watching, you know how complicated the word is. Unwarranted the solarly market dynamics that pose a serious threat. Who says in a market that something is unwarranted? Uh, in this case, the ECB will get to decide when the market dynamics are unwarranted. If they start suddenly thinking that it's warranted, then they stop intervening. But the problem is, can they really stop intervening? So this allows them to buy the debt of one country. You will say, oh, this is like Draghi. This is like OMT, right? No, it's not like OMT. And that's why I was very precise about what Draghi did. Is very far from the strict conditionality of OMT. Look, the conditions to activate this are four. You have to comply with the EU fiscal framework, which right now is suspended till 2023, so this is not relevant. There has to be absence of several macroeconomic imbalances, so this is decided by the European Commission, and it's it's not a hard, fast rule. And you have to comply with the European semester and the recovery plans. I'll show you in a second what that means, but it's not strict at all. So one, two, and four are not strict. So basically, it's going to be, is the debt sustainable? And is the EU Commission, the ESM, and the IMF and the ECB is saying this debt is sustainable. And if it is, we'll intervene. That's the that's the rule. Now, I just want well, to tell all you. All of the institutions, I have to say, not only one. No, yeah, of several ever... institutions, including the EU Commission. Several. I think there's a lot of flexibility here. But I want to tell you, Argentina's debt has been declared this year sustainable by IMF. And it was declared sustainable two years ago. I mean, what do you need to do to declare debt sustainable? To have a good assumption of G. G, growth rate. What do we think is G? That tells us what do we think is sustainability. It is, I think, a very soft condition in a moment of crisis will be fudged like it has always been. So it's different from OMT in two ways. There is no fiscal backstop from the member states. You don't have to go to the ESM, go into a program, have some conditionality, et cetera, et cetera. This means that without a fiscal backstop, is the ECB really credible? Remember, Draghi could say, oh, you know, 
I don't think I'm buying your debt, but I don't think I'm going to continue doing it because I don't think you're doing your job in being responsible. He could do it because the ESM was behind and the country could make a new program with the ESM. Here, if the ECB were to withdraw from TPI, um, all hell would break loose. The country would probably, would probably default. So it's a very tricky decision for the ECB. Without any fiscal involvement, it has, in my opinion, put itself in a very complicated position. It can, it's going to be very hard for the ECB to raise rates without causing fiscal tensions because it's going to be very hard to, as you raise rates, you make your country's debt less sustainable and actually in the short end of the year, which is when countries go when they're in, in crisis situations. And it's going to make, make it very hard to unwind the sovereign loan, loan portfolios when he's worrying about this kind of instability. Um, and now I want to tell you about the fiscal rules. I told you they are suspended. The fiscal rules have been one of the big failures of the European Union of the Maastricht Treaty. Um, this slide is very complicated, I'm aware, but I think all the message I want to transmit to you is it is very complicated. These are the preventative, uh, this is the stability and growth pact, which makes sure that countries follow the fiscal rules. There is a preventative arm, a corrective arm, there is a governance, and there are some flexibilities. All of these things have changed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times in depth. Um, for example, exceptions have gone from deficit to 3% unacceptable in some particular thing to a special circumstance for deviations from the PNUTM objective to unusual event clauses to excluding European events. I mean, all of these things have been changing and have making it so complicated. Let me just give you one example. To give a fine, you need the commission. This is the process to leave, to put sanctions under their corrective arm. So countries not behaving, it needs sanctions. The commission has to one, two, three, four times propose something to the council, which the council has to vote one, two, three, four times by qualified majority voting or reverse qualified majority voting. The result is that, and this is one of my answers, never has been a fine put uh, for violating these rules, actually. Can you specify majority qualified majority voting? That's the qualified majority. Yes, qualified majority voting is a, it's a, a, a certain percent I mean, because it's sometimes reversed, et cetera. It's a certain percent of member states and of, and of population, uh, depending on, on, on the individual step. Um, so this is no fines in a time where uh, not only just the average deficit has been often over 3%, but obviously if the average deficit is there, you can imagine where the individual deficits of the member states have been. So the but commission says- It's also a fine in the middle of a crisis. No, that's- huh? When you're in the middle of the euro crisis, it's hard to impose an additional fine on the country. Yes, but you know that the moment this thing collapsed was here. Um, in Germany and France were the yes. first countries to have deficits over the 3%, to have the European Commission warn them, to have the Council and then Portugal, to have the Council say, no, 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 no. Probably for political reasons, there was an election here in, in Germany. Basically, once Germany and France in this moment where there was no crisis, no problems, it was just like, okay, this is the first time to make. If Germany, which is the proponent of this, is not actually allowing this process to happen, then probably from then on, people just don't believe in it. So it's here. It's, I agree. It's not here where the fines should have been imposed. It's here where it should have happened. Um, so the commission says, look, this process is a disaster. We don't like it. We're going to propose a different thing. And I think they're right to propose a different thing. And this is just a very recent proposal, which basically says, look, instead of having a preventive arm and instead of continuing reforms, little by little, we're going to do a big reform. We're going to classify countries into groups, three groups, low, medium, and high. And if you're in high risk, you have to negotiate a multi-annual adjustment path of your primary expenditure, excluding unemployment insurance and interest payments. That seems reasonable. And it's much better than the cyclically adjusted deficit, which nobody knows how to calculate and goes up by one and a half, when it goes crazy up and down all the time. And you have to agree on a path, path of plausible decline over 10 years based on a plan adopted by your council based um, commission assessment. So you would look at it and you say, well, it looks okay. The problem is the politics of this. Look, the path of plausible decline takes 10 years. And the commission in the proposal says you can start seeing actual declines of debt to GDP ratios in four years, or in some cases, in seven. There's no politician who can commit for four years. In fact, they all are, will be happy to commit for something in four years. It will just not matter, because it will be um, for the next government that comes. 
Also, the plan is based on the commission assessment. Can really the commission be trusted? Um, I will tell you in a second, as I promise you. And then the sanctions, and they've decreased. Uh, really does it at least imply that for the first three years there's a second derivative that at least the increases slow down? There's nothing like this stated in this. No, it's it's, it's a one to one plan negotiated. Uh, it has to be plausible decline. I mean, I guess plausible. I would I would imagine it would have to be um, it would have to be uh, for plausibility to be considered. The problem is again, I don't think the commission can be trusted. And, and look at this. Many of you who are watching are, are, are professors or or work in education and, and in many ways as postdocs or PhD students. This is the grades the commission gave to the next generation, to the, all the first batch of next generation plans. What, what you will see is that in question one, all the students get an A, in question two, all the students get an A, in question three, all the students get an A. They only get Bs in question nine, and all of them get Bs. Um, this is how the commission is taking these uh, these are all countries with different environments, different everything. I can't imagine that one is not more careful with the environment, the other was not more careful with cost justifications. It seems hard to believe, right? But they all get the same grades because the commission ultimately is a political referee subject to political constraints. And so I think my main criticism of this proposal is the governance has to be taken out. We have the European Statist Stability Board. We have the possibility of creating agencies, we have independent fiscal agencies, it, this has to be taken out of the commission. So, so the fiscal councils are not, the, the, the national fiscal councils and there's a European fiscal council, they're not involved at all? No, um, this was something that the EMF was pushing for. The commission has been criticized for not involving the national fiscal councils as, 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 as the IMF would have wanted. I am still doubtful that the national fiscal councils would have been willing to put their own governments in a trajectory which would have been very politically difficult. I think it should be a European fiscal council, the counterpart of the European Central Bank. We can talk about proposals. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many minutes do I have, Marcus? I only have five slides, so about ten minutes. Okay, so so yes, so we can talk briefly about this. I mean, my ideally, I, the way I would like to see it, Marcus, would be um, a, something involving a fiscal council that has the ability to, to allow access to some sort of joint borrowing mechanism for defense, for all the joint European public goods that we really do need, energy transition, in exchange for good behavior by the countries. Imagine there was a European fiscal council that could say, look, here is a pot of money that we have issued together. People can, can get to this money if they are in compliance with these recommendations. Then countries can sell to their voters, no, no, we're doing this adjustment of this growth enhancing reform because we're going to get this extra money. That seems politically plausible and, and credible because you have an external agency. What is being set up, I'm sorry, but it's just one more turn of the screw of the same thing we've been having since 1999 that never has led to, to consolidation. So what next? So how are how is such a debt overhang solved? So think of all the situations you've seen post Second World War and many other cases where you see big debt, big debt situations. You have growth, that's what we all want. G, much, much, much bigger than R would be ideal. Then we don't need to do anything. Um, the problem is that I think with our reforms, what the last decade or two decades of Europe suggests is that we don't get growth with our reforms. Um, you need, and for that, you need to take on vested interest. And, and this happened in Greece, in Portugal, in Ireland, post 2012. And I want to say that these team countries have been doing pretty well, that there is a huge amount of criticism of all the conditionality and what happened in the 2010s without noticing that these were countries that have actually managed to go in a pretty good growth path since. So that's one possibility. The second is pure state consolidation, but that you know hurts taxpayers, hurts the general public. This is difficult. Obviously, my preference is for reforms that lead to growth. I don't see any discussion in a Euro European country of growth-enhancing reforms. The other possibility is not to pay. How? You can default. Although the more debt the central bank holds, the less the default is going to work, because obviously the central bank is part of the consolidated general budget. So defaulting on the central bank just changes where the debt is. So you're going to basically need a bigger haircut of private creditors the more the central bank has, 
And obviously, private creators are not going to stand for gigantic haircuts. So the default also becomes less likely with, with these large amounts of debt held by the central banks. And inflation, which seems right now a, a, the possible path of this resistance, but since the QA has shortened the consolidated debt uh, duration, uh, a little bit of inflation is not going to help because this gets all refinanced. So you will get you will need more inflation to, to get rid of the debt. Can I just quick, quickly ask? Yes, yes, uh, sorry, sorry. Guido Lorenzoni asked about the fines and the sanctions. Uh, is it possible to use the next generation funds? If you don't behave, you don't get the next generation funds. Uh, that is, that was the promise of these funds. These funds were not, these funds, uh, Guido had two rationales. For some people, they were Keynesian funds. It was about stimulus, about getting the economy going. For many of us, including me, there were structural funds. There were the opportunity to get growth. And the way that we would get growth would be, look, you're going to have to present a plan. You're going to have to fulfill this country's specific recommendations, which are growth-enhancing reforms, if you want to get the money. Okay, That was, you're going to have to consolidate, get your pension straight. Uh, you're going to have to get you know, better energy policies, et cetera, et cetera. So this was the promise of the next generation funds as, as set up in the recovery and reconstruction fund, which is the main fund that has used this money and which I are participating in, in writing the legislation for. Now, what happens is that either you can have two hypotheses and I let you choose. I don't, we don't need to be mean. Even because the Keynesian reasons predominated and people, the commission thought, look, uh, we cannot get money people without this money because they need it for growth. We cannot stop this flow of money. Or because politics dominated and the commission, after all the austerity, wanted to be popular and go there and take a nice picture with the prime minister saying, hey, we're all friends, etc." The truth of the matter is the commission, in my opinion, has not, let me be clear, my opinion, has not done its job of demanding serious reforms. And I can tell you, for me, the most clear example has been the Spanish pension reform. Spanish pension reform involved two things, uh, making them more uh, sufficient and making them more sustainable. Anybody who wants to do those two things, one is raising the pension, another one is raising the capacity to pay, or one is raising the pension, the other one is lowering them, whatever way you want to talk about them, wants to do those two reforms together, wants to give the broccoli and the dessert at the same time. What the commission did is it gave Spain the dessert. It allowed Spain to like get rid of all the automatic adjustment mechanisms that had been introduced in 2012 as part of the reforms during the crisis and said, okay, and next year, and we'll give you a check when you do this, and next year, you are supposed to think about making this sustainable, which is the deadline, 31st of December, that the Spanish government is dealing with right now. So something that could have been, okay, good pension reform for Spain, if you are serious about understanding the politics and enforcing it, has transformed into basically free money. That is my fear, and, and, and Guido is completely right. That would have been the money that should have been uh, making this sustainable. Um, so, can I ask I, you, concerning this other uh, slide, uh, you know, one big element of getting the debt level down after the Second World War was also financial repression. Uh, do you think it's possible to? Do we need financial repression uh, to achieve that again? I, I think Hanno Lustig so has been, yeah, Hanno Lustig has been has been arguing that this is where we're heading, that this is the only place where, where, where this thing ends. And, and on the basis of historical evidence, I think that's, 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 that's one possibility. I mean, with free capital mobility, it's not the same as under Bretton Woods, right? What, what is your view in, in that in, in the current world? I mean, uh, people are not going to allow below, below market rates uh, returns, right? I mean, so, as long as the whole world is doing it, it's probably fine because you can't go sure. anywhere. Good point. But if the US is doing much better, then people will move out of Europe. And uh, great points. That's going to depend on the on the international. So let me just make one point about QE. It's very interesting today when Nagar talked. I was watching her press conference, and she was talking about this cute Q and quantitative tightening has nothing to do with the monetary policy stance. Nothing. So it's not about inflation. It's about something else. Um. And it's very interesting because when we they did put the QE, it was about monetary policy and about nothing else. Um, and the truth is that QE is going to work 
against the current interest rate increases. The previous QE, if they don't do the QT, is going to work in the interest rate increases for the simple reason that the, the central bank has a huge balance sheet, 4.5 trillion in excess reserves right now by the banks in deposited in the, in the balance sheet. You exclude the TLTROs where, where the bank has already said they're not going to pay anything. So you have 3 trillion of excess reserves and the market expects the terminal rate to be 3%. So back of the envelope, that means the ECB is going to be paying 90 billion a year. That's kind of a direct liquidity injection apart from a transfer from the taxpayer, apart from a loss of capital for the national central banks. And to some extent, it's working contrary to the interest rate. So, so from the perspective of the ECB, having this balance sheet is also not obvious, not just from the perspective of the incentives of the I government. Mean, one policy measure would be to increase required unremunerated, non-remunerated reserves and lower the excess reserves in order, which is financial repression in a sense. But. Which is financial repression. And, and in fact, we all remember during the 60s and 70s, this obligatory, the division between excess reserves and the obligatory reserves is kind of arbitrary. So you already have 3 trillion there. Let's call of these 3 trillion, uh, 2 trillion obligatory reserves, end of the story, that gets zero remuneration. Right now, the bank is paying on all of these reserves the deposit rate, which goes up each time the monetary policy tightens, and you're completely right. From one day to the next, the European Central Bank would say, sorry, these are obligatory reserves and this is not remunerated. You're completely, completely right, and that's one solution. Um, so the risk that I wanted to point out is the risk that the ECB is to some extent trapped. Uh, the, high, the high policy rates may backfire via R minus G, via dropping the, the growth rates, uh, and without QT, the ECB is inviting countries, these 20, 19, almost 20 countries, to hold it hostage. Um, the, the balance sheet normalization of this 330-month horizon is going to be very long. There will be another crisis. Another time the balance sheet will be bigger. We don't have any buffers there. And, and at some point, my fear, and the fear I wanted to share with you, given the situation, is um, that inflation at some point is really the only answer to this conundrum. Um, so thanks very much. And uh, happy to take any other questions, Marcus, from you. Yes. Or from um, so, I mean, of course, the inflation only works really if it's either financial repression or surprise inflation. So for this, you have to lock in some long-term debt complex. So do you... Yeah, no, I, I agree with you, Marcus. The, 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 length, uh, the length has been shortened very much by QE. Um, the average maturities are, are relatively short. We're talking about five, I mean, and below five-year debts, and all of that gets refinanced once the inflation rate is higher. I was looking at, at the refinancing needs somewhere like Italy, for example, has to refinance uh, something like 25 between interest rate payments and rollovers, 25% of GDP this year. So that's debt already. That is even whatever inflation you have is not getting rid of that debt because that's already debt that is priced at the new rate. So, so you're very right. Inflation is not, I mean, eventually... It's, I mean, we all fear this kind of situation where eventually you need higher inflation in order to do the same effect of cutting debt as, as, as before. I, I would love to hear what, what you think uh, about that. Uh, I mean, uh, what I can see too, is, as we've talked about, your required reserves are going up, which is essentially a tax on the banks. And the other thing is you just require the banks to hold more sovereign bonds through some liquidity, macro potential regulation. And these are all financial repression. Financial repression. Mm -hmm. And... The question is, are the banks strong enough to sustain that? So, so in this sense, banks have an incentive to be weak because if they're strong, they'll, all these measures will be pushed onto their balance sheets. I remember you, you had a, a lecture in 2016 in Italy uh, on financial yeah, repression yeah. where you were, yes. you were arguing this point. I think it's a really good point, right? That a bank that is strong is kind of very subject to, uh, to being used as a as a source, or is not going to be able out. And a bank that is weak, as, as, as you were saying, Marcus, right now, is one that cannot be used as a cash cow for, for sovereign bonds, for, for, uh, for financial repression. So I agree with you that banks are going to fight uh, really hard against all... Well, they were already fighting very hard against Basel of trade regulations. They, they were really kind of trying to empty them out. And when I was in Parliament, I don't know what's happening now, there was really a concerted effort by, by German and French banks to, 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 to get rid of that. And I think even more now, um, because you're right, um, the writing probably for them is, is on the wall. I mean, we have to watch whether they start dividend payments now and purchase stock repurchases, because that's probably the optimal response for them at the moment.
I think that is the optimal response. You're, you're very right. And, and, and I think that, that uh, you, I don't know if you saw from the, I, maybe you are in it, actually. You were part of the people doing it. The EFSRB uh, um, index of, uh, of risk in the financial stability risk. And it was not, obviously not at, at, at the financial crisis levels, but it was definitely in the highest levels in the last 10 years. I could imagine private debt being an issue pretty soon. And as a result, relatively quickly um, seeing repercussions towards the private uh, banks. So I would expect and hope that the financial, as you said, the financial regulators are really cautious on this, on this end. So th the other question I have, which is related to financial repression, is the digital euro. So one can see that you know private digital currencies are popping up. And there might be some which are alternatives which make financial repression more difficult. And uh, by having the digital euro, uh, you have probably better tools to also outlaw the private digital currencies. Is, do you think that's what's going on behind the digital euro as well? That it's essentially a way to ensure we can do financial repression at the end of the day? I think the digital euro definitely allows, allows uh, I, I, was, I, I also think of it in a, in a very similar way. But let me just hist just go back historically one one bit, which is to say that when the European Central Bank has really cons been concerned and starting to think of digital euro has been when China and Facebook have moved. Facebook came first, everybody panicked. We're going to lose senior as this is going to happen in some private way. We need to be in this business and China as well played this part. And uh, I agree with you that that it does allow much more financial repression. I, I, I just want to make one comment about the design I saw Fabio Panetta testifying in, Congress, in, in Parliament. I asked him questions and I pushed him. And there's something really interesting about the design of the digital euro, which is it is one of the strange times when you're doing the design wrong or badly on purpose. The, the fear of the ECB is that the digital euro would be so successful. I mean, think of it for our audience. If you can put $100,000 directly with the European Central Bank, why would you have $100,000 in, in your private bank that is subject to bank runs, et cetera? So you put it there and, and you forget about it. Now, they would be scared that banks would run out of deposit funding because people would take it out. They, they would cause financial stability. They think that's very, very dangerous. So they are looking for how to make the digital euro bad or handicap this digital euro by limiting maximum payments and maximum amounts you can hold in it and by including uh, costs by raising interest rates, that uh, by, by, by putting some cost of holding the money in that digital euro. I don't know if politically that would be viable. Once the digital euro existed, once people were able to put 10,000, there would be pressure to why can't they not put 15,000? But you're right. The other side of the coin is the European Central Bank would be able, with the digital euro, to put the interest rates down on cash as much as it wanted once we're using that for cash. So in particular, during crisis times, you would say that the pressure, the political pressure will be so large to lift the limit from... To you know, lift the uh, limits. People would say, why do I have to be exposed to this if I have this other perfectly fine, this other, this credit card is subject to risk. This other beautiful one is not subject to risk. So please raise the limit. And the politicians would say, yeah, raise the limits. What would they say? It's logical. So who should decide the design issues? Should it be the European Parliament or should it be the ECB? Uh, given what you just said, it needs to be an independent institution saying, okay, this is clearly politically unpopular. We stick with the two or 3,000 euros limit. I and think it's a politi political department. I mean, I know I that you're part of the European Parliament, but... <laughs> I think the ECB, yeah, the ECB should, should be very wary of, of taking too much of a lead here because I, I think it's ultimately a huge political decision that affects the viability of banks and of and the, the shape of the entire financial system. And it not, I mean, and I have I have told this to them in private uh, in interventions in the parliament, this not should not be considered just some technical design problem, but it should be really implemented through proper legislation and proper uh, accountability with, with both the, the countries, the member states and the parliament. So I would like to follow up with one question Guido Lorenzoni asked about, you know, using tax or uh, using cash to, to avoid taxes. And I'm just reading his question to you. So when it comes back to the earlier question he had about, uh, you know, the, the sanctions you can impose from next generation EU funds. So he says in for Italy, a more positive example, albeit, albeit smaller in smaller scale. Now Italy is trying to pass a budget law, making life easier for tax evaders to use cash. The 
EC says, the European Commission says, is saying that it's not okay because under the recovery plan, you committed to curb tax evasions. And Italy will have to change the budget law. The same is negatively successful. So it's like an example where the next generation additionality at least says to the government, you can't really promote tax evasion. I'm really, really delighted. If this is happening, I congratulate the commission. I didn't know the example. And, and this is what indeed uh, next gen should be for, uh, to, to make sure that that uh, the reforms are implemented and that the countries are, are actually uh, not kind of putting their whole fiscal sustainability and growth mm -hmm. situation at risk. So normally we have the tradition, you know, your outlook, it looks very bleak. It doesn't look very positive for the euro area. Um, can you give us a positive spin on it? Yes, How do we get out of it in a sense? What should we change? Uh, and what yeah, of course, of course. I mean, I'm, in, I'm an extreme, no. extreme pro-European and uh, I, am, I am somebody who believes that Europe is, is <laughs> the solution. I do believe that what what we get seem to get back every time is that Europe uh, has a monetary union that, I mean, is, does need some sort of political union behind it and some sort of fiscal support behind it and, and a real budget. And a real budget comes with the ability to set some taxes and with the ability to have a government. And what you Europeans should be thinking about is debt. Is, and no, it's not debt. It should be energy. It should be the war. It should be our security in the future, our defense commitments. And we shouldn't be having to think about who is going to pay and how the debt. And that would require a single, some sort of single European political entity with one president, etc. And you cannot do that with 27. So I think that Draghi was pointing that out last year in the parliament in one way. Macron has proposed it in other ways. I mean, we do need a set of countries who decide that they want to advance further. We cannot continue having Orban's veto everything and people like him. By the way, there was one big success of this next gen that I didn't mention, which was the rule of law mechanism, which has forced Orban to start changing certain things. So, so I don't want to say that, that we are not putting any conditions because the rule of law conditions have been put. So the rule of law conditions are, 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 are kind of a good, a good sign. We have, I think, the gem in this next generation EU of the European countries believe realizing that it cannot all be just some monetary non-solution, but that we need some fiscal tools to deal with fiscal problems. And I hope that we can walk towards a real political union by a smaller set of countries and that really has the ability to raise some taxes and pay debt and in, in, in the normal way that 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 they should. And I think that um you know, Europe was built in crisis, as Monet said, and the, the construction will be the result of all this crisis. Maybe um, we see uh, more of a move towards uh, a, a new step in the construction once this construction that we are seeing proves the fragility that I am anticipating. And I'm sorry to be a bit negative, but that's how I see it. Um, it becomes a part of But you're more hopeful that rather than getting the fiscal house in order, you're more hopeful that people unify the military in Europe and people give up military, you know, Germany, France, as we transfer this to Brussels. Um, I, I would think that, uh, so these are the two big, big missing parts, right? We don't have a, a way to tax people and we don't have a common defense. And both have been kind of, uh, done by unanimity historically, and of course, military, we have one country versus nuclear weapons, and all the rest don't. One kind of security council seat, and the other ones don't. And, and we also have the reality that the countries in the north of Europe have decided that they don't trust Germany and France anymore, because when it came, it came to the trouble, it was the US who was defending them, and not Germany and France. So, so I realize all the problems with, with defense and international uh, union, but I do think that Europe has its own interest in the world, but it's going to be different than, than, than the others. And we want to work with the US, but I hope that that reality becomes more and more apparent with, with this war. Um, I, I mean, you know, when you see it from the inside, everything looks like really kind of impossible to move, but we all know that it seems impossible until, you know, when I went into parliament in 2019, I left academia, I went for three years in the European parliament. I didn't think we would issue Eurobonds. 
I mean, you and I know that Merkel had said so many times, no way. And even kind of synthetic Eurobonds seem like it's too much. And then suddenly things could happen that we thought were impossible. So I am hopeful. I believe in your European construction, I think. So coming with the final question about inflation, what, how big do you think is the risk that inflation stays high and with it the reputation of the ECB and with it then the reputation of the whole European project will be questioned? So in particular, to, yeah, that might to. be very dangerous. Right now you get the cover of the Ukrainian war and they say, oh, it's all because of the Ukrainian war. But once this goes away, uh, people will say, is Europe really the right institution, the right level to deal with this? I, thing? I have venture forecast, which I which one should never do. In exchange, you do your own after me, okay? Uh, so, so I would say my guess is that given the difficulty in putting our fiscal house in order, the kind of logic that you anticipated before my talk, uh, the fiscal type logic that in, leads to, 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 to inflation uh, seems pretty strong, that, that, that type of logic. We've, you've evaluated and I've gone step by step showing people why. It seems to me that that points to much longer and more sustained inflation. In my first slide, I showed the ECB has again raised its forecast for next year postpone the moment when it gets to 2% by another year. I would imagine that that's going to happen multiple times. And my only question would be, do we think that it's stable 5% inflation for a few years uh, or inflation that kind of feeds on itself and accelerates? But I would expect one of those two to be more expectable in scenarios on the basis of what I just outlined on the fiscal side. What is, what is your view? No, I, I'm afraid that, I mean, what I'm afraid is if inflation stays high, the trust in European institutions in general will go down and then the whole European project will be put in question. That's why I think it's really essential to, to make sure this will not happen. And that's a huge responsibility on behalf of the ECP beyond yeah. just, you know, the mandate. It's just, you know, preserving the European project. Yes, yes, Marcus. I, that's why I would say, that QT is important, conditionality is important, making the member states kind of do the plans they've committed with, with the semester. The commission doesn't have to be Panoel. Uh, Madame von der Leyen doesn't have to be smiling, giving checks to governments. She has to be there saying, look, this is all Europe, Europeans' money. You have to do certain things to receive it. And we have to be very, very, very uh, firm on it. So Martin Müller has the last question, then we close. Um, it's, do you see, you know, there's political economy problems to go for a consolidation phase on the fiscal side, but do you think if they are coordinate at the European level, it would be easier to do some fiscal tightening rather than each country being prescribed by the commission saying you have to do this and this, like we all do it together in a particular way of a change in mindset right now we still have a lot of this MMT mindset we can just spend without problems. Uh, but if there's a change in mindset then all of us would try together to fix that. From I your think, political experience, do you think that's feasible or that's easier to obtain? Yes, I see this as difficult in the moment when governments have kind of, we, we, we learned two lessons from the pandemic. The one is that micro doesn't matter, you can intervene in prices. And the one is that macro doesn't matter, you can expand your budget deficit without consequences. And now you have to teach people again that, that prices, relative prices are crucial. You can just subsidize all sorts of oils and fuels and gasolines and all sorts of things without limit. And you have to again teach people that that the actual debt and deficit levels matter and and politically there is no appetite for that in any european country there is no discussion of that even in germany even the the, the most the country which is more careful with that and uh, that's not even in, in, in the map i think um so i would say it would have to be the european central bank and i am not asking for fiscal consolidation short run that says next year you lower your deficit i'm asking for medium-term sustainable plans. And that starts with uh, pension systems that are sustainable. And if you get that firm and people see that the implicit debts are sustainable, then you can be a little bit more flexible with the short run. But you need to be sure that, that you have systems that are sustainable over the medium run. Thanks a lot, Luis. I think you Thank was you. a fantastic uh, exposition of what's going on. It's probably more on the sad side, hopefully the whole thing will be turned around and uh, uh, we can go forward with the European project uh, going of course. into Absolutely. the future. Thank you very much. And thanks again. And we stay in touch. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye, everybody. And uh, I wish all of you 
uh, happy holidays and a happy new year. We see each other next year. And thanks for hanging with us, staying with us for so many sessions now. Bye-bye.